So today's webinar, Environmental Influences on Mental Health, Path Analysis for Contextual Implementation, which is presented by Dr. Daniel Gann, um, who is an urban planner with expertise in community-engaged research and place-based interventions for health equity among less advantaged older adults in community housing. He completed his PhD at the National University of Singapore on neighborhood atmospheres and affordable housing and their impact on well-being. At SFU Gerontology, Dr. Gan uh, further validated and extended his transdisciplinary neighborhood health framework to include cognitive health and examine CLSA data using contemporary effective approaches and sex and gender-based analysis. He is a CIHR fellow in research and knowledge translation in urban housing and health and winner of the 2021 CIHR IA Fellowship Prize of Excellence in Research on Aging. So with no further ado, I, uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Gan get going. Hello everyone, thank you for um, having me here today. Um, let me just share screen. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I will just pick up on a few um, things in this title. Um, first, um, implementation and mental health here, we're referring to both um, depressive symptoms, life satisfaction, and also things like cognition, cognitive function. Um, and the other, the other peculiar thing in my title, which is really, really long, which is given by CIHR, is that you see a bit on um, knowledge translation um, and urban housing. So um, putting all these few things together, it's, it's, it's really quite a big um, heady thing. And, and this is what I will be attempting to do today. Um, um, in addition to my role at Simon Fraser University, I'm also founder and community planner at Healthy Aging in Place, a nonprofit. At the end of this webinar, um, you will be able to identify individual and environmental levers for mental health promotion. Um, and name suggests ways to overcome potential confounders of interventions in community settings and explain the usefulness of path analysis. Uh, for example, to identify relevant intermediate targets or to systematically develop interventions for translation across contexts. Okay, um, I'm often asked, what is community planning? Um, and I find it best to uh, um, explain it this way. It is primarily a type of social planning, but it extends it into the field that perhaps people in the room are a little bit more familiar with or not so. Um, so social planning is a discipline in urban planning that focuses not so much on the built physical environment, but the social environment, which is also in a sense built because we construct this social environment that we are, uh, we are in and the kind of systems and the kind of services and provisions that are available. So social planning focuses on the um, non-physical built environment. You can think of it that way, or you can just call it social environment. But, um, but we know that, um, that that's just one approach to things. And then there are many other approaches that are relevant in the community. For example, a lot of prevention or health promotion happen in community settings. And um, one of the most cutting edge areas called implementation science. And it has been around for a long time, but recently it has received quite a bit of attention because of the promise that it, uh, it can um, translate <laughs> research impact directly into our communities because we, we don't want to do research for knowledge sake alone, but we want this knowledge to be mobilizable and mobilized into the community. So implementation science is the study of how programs translate across contexts. What caused it to fail? What caused it to succeed? And um, the, the typical approach now to implementation science is you think of a program, you try it in the community, and then you get all kinds of feedback on whether or not it works or doesn't, from barriers to um, um, quantitative outcomes on health. Um, and then after you, you write that report, you think, okay, now that I'm gonna implement it in a different community, um, how, I'm, how might I do differently? Um, if, if you have a community psychologist in your room um, and your intervention is quite psychosocial, I mean psychological or social, um, then they will say something different. They will say, 
hey, actually, the communities are not all the same. The order in which you test out your interventions matter. Um, and if you test out in a neighborhood of these characteristics, and then later test it out in a ne different neighborhood of another characteristics, you might want to adjust some things. So that is what I call community planning. I'm extending social planning into these two overlapping and extending fields. So that's a lot for now, and it might be a little bit difficult to make sense of what I'm going to present next. And so for that reason, I'd like to invite you to take um, maybe half a minute to choose one of the following three things on the side. Imagine in this presentation, as you are listening, a policymaker uh, working at a large provincial level deciding how to allocate budgets of money to different places or programs. That's one. Number two, uh, imagine you're a director of seniors program at a community organization serving one particular neighborhood. Um, and you get to decide um, how much resources to allocate to different activities or um, how you want to run your activities or how you want to um, I don't know, recruit and um, identify facilitators or, or um, structure programs to uh, keep your clients, the older adults, happy. Or three, maybe you are not an older, older adult yourself, um, so you're not above 65 for the purposes of um, definition, if you like to define it that way. Um, and, and then maybe if you're not that, then maybe you can choose number three. Um, imagine you're an older adult with different kinds of experiences, some healthier, some not so, um, and different kinds of constraints. Maybe you are retired, maybe you are not, um, and maybe you have lots of wealth or not so much. So how would that change how you receive some of this information and the kind of questions that you would have. So yeah, this is my way of keeping this webinar interactive and I hope to have that kind of questions from you um, to see where we go together. So I hope you have chosen one of the three, um, policymaker, director, and older adult. And then now um, imagine um, this just to help you get into that scenario, imagine this is the map that you can choose from and on the maps you see different colors um, representing different degrees of socioeconomic deprivation and different kinds of well-being and this is um, a partial map of British Columbia around mainly Metro Vancouver actually and and you you reside or you are charged uh, you are taking charge of a portion of this map or you reside in one of these uh, neighborhoods or forward sortation area. It's a postcode prefix, the first three digits of our postcode. So one of you are one of the three rows in one of this um, area or a region. All right, now we're ready to begin. So what will we do in this webinar? We'll be, um, um, there will be three parts. First, I will highlight the needs for intervention um, among older adults age 70 and over with this um, uh, study that is published on depressive symptoms so with my colleague John Bass. Dr. John Bass is an excellent biostatistician, so humble and so excellent to work with. I've learned a lot from him. Um, and the two other studies that I'll be presenting are path analysis. Um, and this is, uh, the first one is on the individual level and the second one is on the neighborhood level. And it will become a bit clearer as we go along. And then we will have a discussion at the end of this um, uh, webinar. Okay, I hope you're ready to begin. The first study is age and sex trends in depressive symptoms among middle and older adulthood. Okay, so we are trying to find out um, what are the trends in depressive symptoms. And depressive symptoms are basically um, how often you feel um, sad, um, how often you feel like you can't get out of ba bed, um, how often you feel um, um, like uh, or it takes a lot of effort to, to do something. So, so those are examples of depressive symptoms. And here we're using cross-sessional baseline data from CLSA and two other national or regional um, longitudinal studies. And that is the health and retirement study in the United States and um, SHARE, uh, sorry, have a retirement studies in the United um, in the United States and share in Europe. Okay, um, and our unit of analysis here is individual, nothing extraordinary here. 
Um, typically, or most of our studies have um, individual as a unit of analysis, and here we're looking at middle age and um, above. So, um, according to CLSA, um, so this is a very descriptive study. Um, according to CLSA, you will see um, that there is a curve um, in depressive symptoms. So throughout your life, depressive symptoms will decrease. Um, oh, um, this, are, this is not really a trajectory, but this is a, a trend um, based on each age, at each age, um, at each age. Yeah, sorry, that's hard to say. So at 50 years old, what is the typical depressive symptoms? At 60, what is the typical? At 90, what's the typical? So on and so forth. That's what we did. And we model this out into this, or we visualize it into this curve, of course, with some um, um, appropriate adjustments. And what we see here is that at it, all through our, our lives, it goes down. Depressive symptoms decreases until a certain point where it starts increasing again. So depressive symptoms have a U-shaped curve in mid and late life. And that is something that has been shown in various studies, but it has never been um, studied to this detail. And we found out here that it increases around age, I would say, 75 here. Um, and that is the Canadian cohort. And there is a difference between male and female in the Canadian cohort. Um, in the American cohort, which has a different way of computing depressive symptoms, here we use um, 10 items, here they use 8 items, which, uh, which is kind of like eight, um, 6 minus 2. Um, and, and so, so the, the numbers here, the absolute numbers here are different, so don't, don't, have, don't have to read too much into it. It doesn't mean that Canadians are generally more depressed. It, it, it's just the way the scales are. Um, and, and here you see also a slight um, upward uh, adjustment around age 75. So it seems that 75 is the number in um, North America where older adults start to in experience increased depressive symptoms. Now, if you're one of the three rows, your question might be why? And if you're a policy maker, you probably want to know what you can do to make it better. If you're an older adult, maybe you want to ask other older adults is that of your friends, um, whether or not um, they do experience such things, assuming you don't, or, or if you are an older adult and you're experiencing increasing depressive symptoms, then, then well, you know you're not alone. Okay, in share, the turning point is slightly different. I would say it's around 60, maybe 65. I'm not very sure here. Um, and again, we see a difference between you know, male and female, um, and then um, towards the end of um, life, or towards the late, old, old age, sorry, I, don't, I shouldn't say that, towards much later life, um, it, um, it converges. So this has some implications, uh, especially if you're, if you're a feminist. Um, and, and, you, and more of us should be, um, and yeah, um, we, we should, uh, one, one way to think about it, it might be, there might really be no difference, it might just be a measurement artifact, that means uh, maybe women are more truthful and then more willing to, to share um, their depressed symptoms when they are reporting in a survey, um, or it just might reflect the, tru the, the truth, I, I, I say, I, I, it could be either of both, um, and it, it, it's probably a combination of both, it might reflect the truth, uh, the reality out there that maybe um, uh, more fe that maybe females experience more depressive symptoms. So it's a combination. It's likely a combination of the two. Um, and 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 if it's a if it's a latter, it is if it's more so the latter. It's a it is indeed a cause of concern. So we should, if you're a policymaker or if you're a director of senior's program, you might want to um, find out ways to include um, females, right? Um, then again, somebody might say it's, it's a survivor bias. Maybe males leave um, shorter lifespan in general by a few years. So maybe, I don't know, it's, it's one of those. Maybe. Okay, I, I will stop here. We can have more discussion about that later. So this is the background of um, the state we're in or the kind of environment that we're working with. Um, and so if we are concerned, we're gentologists, we're concerned with the well-being of older adults, we would be especially drawn to what's happening here. Okay, that's the background, descriptive study, um, nonetheless very important. And in this second study, um, in some sense also descriptive, but um, a little bit more um, complex in the analysis, um, in the sense of we're trying to find out what is the mediation um, effect. And, and I do this through, uh, what, uh, we do this through what we call path analysis. Um, and 
um, I want to acknowledge my um, co-authors at the end of this presentation. So environmental influences of life satisfaction and depressive symptoms. Um, so we add life satisfaction here. Among older adults here, we're looking at 65 and above only with multimorbidity. And I'm particularly interested with loneliness um, as um, a potential um, important mediator. And then you'll see that the mediation analysis we do here is a little bit more complex than the normal ones. We have four levels instead of three. And here we're going to use longitudinal baseline and follow up one data. Um, again, you know, analysis of individuals and ages 65 and above with multiple chronic illnesses. And this one, for example, there are total lists of um, 27 that can be derived from uh, CLSA data. And this can range from diabetes to high blood pressure to um, cancer and, 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 and things like that. Yeah, many, many um, types of uh, chronic illnesses from more severe to more um, common. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to present my results in two um, path diagram. Or, um, and this is, uh, this is the first one on live satisfaction. So here, um, my outcome is uh, put on the right, and then my predictors are put on the left. My mediators are put in the middle. And so my theorized causal direction is from left to right. So here we have housing and neighborhood factors, the intermediate variables that I'm interested in, and then psychological resilience um, on the on all the outcomes on the right. So the outcome and intermediate variables, which is these three columns, are controlled for age, sex, education, and baseline um, if they're significant at zero order. Um, that means if they if we do a simple um, regression, uh, um, univariate regression and then they are correlated, then we will control for the relevant um, variables. If they're not, then uh, we don't do so to avoid introducing um, extra um, unnecessary complications to the to the model. Yeah. So um and um so you see here that uh, my control variables are not shown in this path diagram. Um that's just for simplicity because uh, our interest is in how these variables that are on this diagram relate to one another. As you can see, there are many arrows and there are uh, many numbers. Um, and these are beta coefficients, and this is the p-value. Um, I, I should have included here the range of the um, um, coefficients, but um, I didn't do so for this study. Um, um, maybe maybe just maybe it's good as well, it's just there are a little bit too many numbers here. <laughs> It would have been three times as many numbers otherwise. So anyway, so we have a very um, clear, uh, and this is published, um, and, and I will show you the, the reference at the end. We have a very clear idea of uh, what we want to test and what we want to test. And um, we found from different um, articles that study uh, mediation or correlation studies um, that um, these things are related and then these things are related, and then these things are related, or these things are related, and then they are mediated by this, and these things are related, and they are medi mediated by loneliness, or these things are related, and they're mediated by all these things. So we find different types of studies, and then we um, try to uh, synthesize them and um, um, create an overall um, hypothesis or try, overall picture of what might be happening. Based on that picture, we um, put things in, put those variables into these columns in this particular order. And then we um, allow, we, we run path analysis, which is a type of structural equation modeling, if, if that's familiar to you. If, if not, you can just think of it as separate. Um, and we allow all the variables to uh, relate to all the variables to their right. So housing quality can go directly to satisf life satisfaction, as you've seen here and it can go directly to social support, which is shown here in this diagram, and it can go directly to walking, which is not shown here in this diagram. That means it is not significant. And, 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 and so um, the way to read this diagram is to note where the lines are missing. So that's one way to read the diagram. So for sure, um, so for, for one, as I pointed out, housing quality among older adults with multimorbidity, with multiple chronic illnesses, it's not correlated with um, walking. So if they um, um, if they live in a better house, um, it's not more likely or less likely that they will go walking around um, their their daily environment. But if um, their neighborhood is cohesive, 
there is a strong chance that they will experience a lot more social support. So I'm just going with the biggest number here, social support, and then they will experience less loneliness. And as a result, they will have um, more life satisfaction. Sorry, the number here is reversed. <laughs> okay, so this is an important path or pathway. Neighborhood cohesion increases social support, increases uh, decreases loneliness and increases life satisfaction. You see that um, two of these three um, intermediate variables have direct impact, direct relationship with our secondary intermediate variable. And that tells me, and these numbers are quite big, and it tells me, uh, especially after we do um, the effect computation or calculation, we found that loneliness is indeed um, quite an important um, variable. So the second model here, we're looking at depressive symptoms. Um, and uh, what we see here that we don't see in the previous diagram is that there is no, there is, um, in the previous diagram, there isn't a direct link from neighborhood cohesion to life satisfaction. It doesn't then mean that neighborhood cohesion is not important, but then rather it means that our intermediate variables explain the effect of neighborhood cohesion on life satisfaction very well. So if you want, so um, this intermediate variables explain 100% of the effect of neighborhood cohesion on life satisfaction. Here, um, the effects, the amount of effects that is explained through this um, 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 intermediate variables as opposed to, and also walking, as opposed to um, this direct um, variable is about 50%. Um, so a lot of it still goes through um, this middle and everything else um, is, is indirect through this four intermediate variables. So as, again, as you can see, um, neighborhood cohesion seems to be the more important um, um, exposure variable and more neighborhood co cohesion increases more um, social support. So they receive more social support as a result. And this is measured with the MOS um, social support scale. Um, and, and then that leads to decreased loneliness. This is measured with the UCLA three item scale. Um, and then that leads to decrease in depressive symptoms. Sorry, again, this, this particular number should be, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, yeah, yeah, it, this number is correct. The, the sign of this number is correct. It's just that I will explain that it decreases loneliness and decreases um, depressive symptoms. The sign here refers to the relationship between loneliness and depressive symptoms. If you have more loneliness, you have more depressive symptoms, which is as expected. So um, this, again, is an important pathway. So we have a um, good refer model fit in this case. Uh, model, model chi square p value was missing, and we have good model fit in this case, which is a way of um, assessing the rigor of path analysis. Because if you run um, almost, okay, not almost any model, if you run many models, they, they, they will converge and you will have a path diagram to draw. But some of them will have um, poor um, indexes, um, goodness of fit or GOF indexes. And that means that um, the, the model is not reliable and it should, and for that reasons, it, it should not be taken to it should not be something that you want to rely upon when you're making decisions. Okay, so that is um, the second study and you see a variety of variables in there and you can imagine how that actually works, right? Especially if you're an older adult or, or if you're a, a very engaged um, director of seniors program, you have worked with um, people um, um, in your community and they, 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 are, they gravitate to a certain kind of activities where they can make friends, where they can talk about um, deeper issues, um, assuming, um, the, assuming the, the, the kind of activities are conducive for them. And, and you, you start to realize that, uh, yeah, maybe that's true. Loneliness, the psychosocial, um, social support, and the social participation, these are the things that really matter to older adults, especially when they are more frail, for example. So, um, so, so now that we ask, okay, if I am going to, if I'm now a researcher, if I'm going to introduce some programs in the community and I, I want this program to be effective and uh, to be tailored to different communities as, as some community such psychologists would suggest, what, what, then, do, what then do I do? Um, um, uh, as, is there more data that can help me? And here I say that um, path analysis uh, is, is um, very relevant um, because if 
then I am designing an activity. I can know that my activity should be targeting loneliness, should be targeting social support. Of course, that doesn't mean that walking is not important. It might be especially important for other populations, uh, maybe who are not so frail uh, and are in their middle age, middle ages. Um, and um, but then if I my my intention is to focus on older adults, then I would try to design activities that target this intermediate and exposure variables. Maybe um, um, horticulture, for example, um, that is uh, nature immersion and, and gardening kind of therapy. Horticulture therapy has been shown to improve social connections. So maybe I will, I will do that. And then when I'm evaluating my program, I will be evaluating them based on whether or not um, loneliness has improved. Um, and if I'm going to um, bring this um, horticulture program into a neighborhood where um, there is, uh, where I know the neighborhood relationships to be more fraught, maybe because they, they experience a lot of fights, um, because um, due to from my experience of working in different communities, I know that some, some, some neighborhoods fight a little bit more or some of them, um, they just don't talk to one another because they don't need to, um, then, then maybe my strategy would need to be different. Maybe I need to amp up my, um, that friending, that befriending piece. Yeah, to create more opportunities for them to get to know one another, maybe before the actual um, gardening activity. Maybe everybody sit around and share a little bit for five, 10 minutes about um, their week. Uh, so maybe their highs and lows or, 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 or something they cooked recently, you know, or something they're interested to plan and why, or, or, or some interesting memory. So, so that they creates more room for that kind of um, social support, kind of friendship that will allow social support. So that's one way we can use path analysis to design our programs. I can talk more about this towards the end. Um, so in this third study, uh, my question is, who needs their neighbors? So having worked in or having, having worked or engaged with different neighborhoods, I, I've come to realize that uh, different neighborhoods really do have uh, different relationships with their neighbors. Um, and um, one of my hypotheses is that um, people with different social economic statuses or neighborhood dif with different social economic statuses tend to require um, or their neighbors more or less. So, uh, so, so there is a difference and that's my hypothesis. Um, you can guess for yourself which, uh, which way I think it is different, who needs their neighbors more, is it the richer or the poorer uh, neighborhoods? Um, and, and we'll find out um, in the next few slides. So here I'm trying to explore neighborhood disparities in cognitive function, and that is uh, inspired by one of the study that I'm going to show in the next slide, not by me. Um, and um, here we're using baseline data only, just for simplicity, because that it's um, still quite exploratory. We will be writing up um, a longitudinal and cross-sectional um, analysis um, in, in the process. Um, um, and uh, here our unit of analysis is neighborhood. So uh, from a community psychology point of view or from a planning point of view, usually planners work with neighborhoods. They don't immediately think of like, I'm trying to benefit individual or the adults or individual residents uh, or, or people in this um, area. They're thinking, how can I benefit this neighborhood? So their unit of analysis is typically a neighborhood. And um, like community psychologists will um, study the characteristics of communities, groups of people um, at one time and not so much. Um, so for example, they might study things like efficacy is or eff it's not, this is collective efficacy, not self-efficacy, not whether or not I believe I can do something, but collective efficacy in the sense that whether or not a group of people can advocate for their own needs. For example, maybe, um, their, maybe the municipality somehow forgot about them and that didn't likely won't happen in most places, but didn't pick up their garbage for like a whole month. And so collective efficacy would mean whether or not this group of neighbors can get together and, and write a letter or something to make sure that their telephone calls don't go unanswered. And, and so that is collective efficacy. And so their ability to organize themselves. So those are characteristics of a group of people. You won't use collective efficacy to describe an individual. Of course, you can ask the individual what they think of the collective efficacy of the group they are part of, but it is not a characteristic of the individual, it is a perception of the individual, and it is a characteristic of the group. 
yeah so depending on how we measure it it can get closer to what we are trying to get at and so i'm just trying to explain that these variables there are different variables that apply to different units of analysis yeah so cohesion is a variable that describes the neighborhood not the individual um not well, it, it can also describe the individual that this individual is more a team player and as a result, maybe the neighborhood can be more cohesive. Um, and, and there is a little bit of overlap there. But but when we talk about collective efficacy, um, maybe there is some relationship with self-efficacy, but typically the relationship is not strong. So different variables um, apply to different unit of analysis. So here we're looking at 40, for ages 45 and above. And um, so I, I said this is inspired by a study, um, and this was the study that I came across um, in the Alzheimer's Association International Conference in year, last year. And um, Dr. Amy Kine, um, um, a medical doctor and also a PhD holder, um, uh, shared with us that they, they, they used the brain imaging data of um, 950 of the adults in, in America. And so upon death, they, they agreed to donate their brains uh, for um, various um, purposes. And then they found um, that, um, that um, based on this organ donors, that when they study its relationship with the area deprivation index of their neighborhood, um, it is linked, the hippocampal, the brain volume, hippocampal volume is linked to neighborhood disadvantage. So those people who live in more disadvantaged neighborhoods have smaller brain volume. Wow, how did that happen, right? How did being somewhere change the size of my brain? Of course, one way, to, one way might be that um, they have lived there all along and we've, we know that um, early childhood um, um, factors um, are probably a very big um, influencer of um, cognitive um, health. And here it's a study on um, what, whether or not um, uh, the, the different kind of risk factors of our dementia. And in early life, um, there is uh, education. Less education will um, attribute, is, can be attributed to for 7% of the dementia risk, and it is likely more. Um, and then in midlife, we talk about things like hearing loss, um, um, don't worry, drinking alcohol in, <laughs> in moderate amount is good. Um, so yeah, don't, yeah, but, but um, too much consumption is bad. Don't worry about that this <laughs> year. Obesity is, is a risk factor. And then in late life, um, a lot of the things that we've talk, been talking about, depression, um, loneliness, social isolation, um, physical inactivity, um, these are contributors of up to like 8 to 10% of um, dementia risk. And of this, 40% of dementia risks are preventable and modifiable. And so if you put on a policymaker hat um, earlier in this um, webinar, you will want now to know how you can reduce this because dementia is going to be, um, to, 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 uh, is, dementia is going to be um, challenging for many people and, and you would want to um, be able to prevent it because now this study, according to Livingston, says you can prevent at least 40% of the dementia risk. I mean, that sounds like almost half um, or one third is preventable. Um, so, so yeah, that, that, so your question will be how, and, and this is, this is my answer. Okay, <laughs> here goes. So how and where might be your question, which neighborhoods should I focus on? And um, so now I'll start, um, I will not answer the question, which neighborhood first, but now I'll start with an overall. Different neighborhoods have different characteristics, as I mentioned. Um, some neighborhoods are more cohesive. Some neighborhoods are more green. They are more um, greenery. And here we use the NDVI, that is a satellite imaging of um, um, a greenery um, at a growing season. Um, I mean, use a mean so that there are oh, uh, CLSA data can be linked to CANU data. Uh, that is the Canadian Urban Environment Data for those who don't know. Um, and here I used um, aggregated the 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 data from the tracking cohort uh, with uh, four or more respondents in an FSA. FSA is the forward citation area, the postcode prefix, um, and I use this to operationalize neighborhood. Of course, it's it's not a perfect operationalization, um, but but for our purposes, um, I guess this will do. And this is what this is the most granular we have. Um, and and so greenness is is the measure of um 
um, greenery on based on uh, satellite imaging and cohesion is um, something they answered in um, I think it was eight eight items um, and and it's things like whether or not you think your neighbors will help you in case of an emergency um, and whether or not people are friendly in your neighborhood or or um, um, in in there are also some other measures on on the physical manifestation of um, of this cohesion lack of cohesion sorry <laughs> okay and here I use three measures of cognitive function. Um, and so we must remember that these are all aggregated data that we are measuring, we are studying neighborhoods, not individuals. Um, and so um, so I adjusted for age, sex, education, and language. Um, language because um, semantic fluency in particular is, is affected by whether or not you, you, you use English or French to answer that um, question. So that is um, one minute, um, name as many, many animals as you can. Um, delay recall is I name you 15 items and a while later after some um, exercises I ask you to recall for me that 15 items and how many you can recall. Executive functioning or the mental alternation test here is um, I ask you to say 1, A, 2, B, 3, C, some of you might have done this before, so on and so forth uh, and see how many you can say. Um, of course the maximum range here is 26, there's no maxi the maximum here is 15 and there is no maximum here. Um, and so, um, and after I average them so that I get a number for each of the 1,100 um, neighborhoods, and then they are controlled for average de material and social deprivation scores, that is again the link canoe data, Canadian urban environment. So um, the canoe data has two measures of uh, neighborhood SES. Actually, in fact, their neighborhood is more fine green than forward sufficient area. Um, um, and they have two parts to it. One is material and one is social. Material is the income level um, and, and things like that. And social is, for example, uh, education level or access to cultural um, activities. I suspect that greenery is actually computed as part of um, like the amenities in the material component. Um, yeah, I would have to read the canoe um, documentation for more um, information on that. To confirm that. Um, and so here we see um, that um, semantic fluency, um, which is uh, one of the cognitive, um, one of the main cognitive measures that has to do with uh, verbalizing or speaking, um, being in the middle. And we see here that um, greenness and cohesion both have a certain, so if you live in a, a neighborhood that's more green, it's, it's more likely that you're, you are verbally more fluent. And um, that's a, and and that will that increases your um, ability to recall better um, after uh, a few minutes the number of items um, that was sh shared with you and then um, and also to do this um, mental alternation test so somehow the brain um, the ability to exercise maybe the the, the our speaking or our tongues is, is somehow connected biologically or neurobiologically to this or cognitively to all this to act maybe to practice to to all these other cognitive measures and we have a um, pretty good um, um, model fit um, again in this case so this is the general across all neighborhoods this is what we found and you can see here um, that um, semantic fluency um, completely explain the effects of greenness and cohesion. There is no other things, no other lines between um, them. There is no lines from greenness to uh, other cognitive um, outcomes, and there is no lines from the cohesion to the cognitive outcomes as well. Okay, overall, all across Canada, 1,150 neighborhoods. Okay, now what if we split them according to richer and poorer neighborhoods? Let's start with material deprivation. So if you are in a neighborhood below 46 um, percentile in terms of social economic status, this is how the picture changes. You see now that there is a line from cohesion to executive function. And before that, the total effects of cohesion on cognitive outcomes is 0.02. I calculate um, this times the value of this plus this, and I get 0.02. And in this case, in this poorer neighborhoods, the number is 1.11. That's a lot higher. That's five times the number that we've seen before. And then that's partly because there is a direct effect of cohesion on executive function. Um, 
And then this is in the richer neighborhoods. That was the poor neighborhoods. And so in the richer neighborhoods, you see that, oh, the amount of greenery actually doesn't influence anything anymore. That tells us that people who are living in richer neighborhoods do not rely on their neighborhood. So who needs their neighbor according to this analysis so far? Poorer neighborhoods, people living in poorer neighborhoods actually need their neighbor. They, they go to the park, they have, they, if they experience a cohesive neighborhood, then um, by socializing, by speaking, they uh, probably improve their cognitive uh, function or they maintain their cognitive function. So that is one way to interpret the data so far. Um, and again, you see in this case, the amount here, it's uh, much lower um, than the number that we've seen just now. Okay, so that was one way to divide the neighborhoods, but what if we divide them according to social, um, um, social, social aspects of social deprivation, social aspects of um, the socioeconomic status. And in this case, with the poorer or the less advantaged or more deprived neighborhoods, again, we see um, a larger number and also the effects, direct effects of cohesion on executive function. Um, and um, yeah, you can see the number here are, are um, relatively um, large. And then here, the, the numbers are, are gone um, in, in bad, well-to-do neighborhoods where people are educated, they don't need their neighbors. They, they, neighborhood cohesion has no impact whatsoever on them. Maybe they live in a more cosmopolitan place where you don't say hi to everyone you meet in the city center or, or, um, um, or, or that's just not the network they will rely on. Um, but then greenery in this case, uh, improve um, their mental or rather the, uh, the verbal fluency and also their cognitive outcomes. So uh, who needs their neighbors? Again, in this study, it tells us that uh, people living in more deprived neighborhoods need their neighbors. So if you're a policymaker, now you got your answer. You will be doing implementation in um, poorer or more deprived neighborhoods. But then more deprived neighborhoods, they're not all the same. Some have better cohesion, some don't. And if you have better, co better cohesion, half your, better, half your battle is won. If there is no good cohesion in the neighborhood, then yes, you will have quite a bit of challenge to address um, depressive symptoms and or um, other um, cognitive outcomes. And so then you need to tailor um, your intervention for that purpose. So next time, when you go into a neighborhood and you want to introduce an intervention, you should know um, what kind of cohesion variables they have. And the good news is CLSA has this data. Yeah. All right. So the, the image, the map that you saw at the start of this um, um, presentation was actually generated from CLSA data um, by, actually, I, I think I've, I might have forgotten to cite this particular article, but you, you can reach out to me and I will be happy to, to share it with you. It's, it's, a, it's by my, my boss um, or my ex-boss, um, uh, Professor Andrew Wister, who is a lead of um, the CLSA study. Um, and so, um, so some implications from the study so far, psychosocial interventions will do well to target loneliness at the individual level. So that's one individual lever um, and cohesion is the environmental lever. Um, it's especially important in neighborhoods with greater social economic deprivation. Path analysis is useful to identify intermediate targets and to systematically translate strategies across contexts. So we don't go into a neighborhood without knowing what it's like, but we already know and we tailor the thing to go into a neighborhood so that other outcomes that we don't measure can come up. For example, um, in complex neighborhoods, um, community engaged interventions will be required because not everything is measured in CLSA. For example, this is something that I did um, in, in another study. Um, and we, we um, dived into 26 qualitative articles and we, uh, through thematic analysis, we found that there's this thing called at homeness that's impro in, is important for community dwelling individuals. And this is uh, broken down into ontological safety, whether or not they feel safe and secure in themselves and um, the related to their, uh, the, their, the possessions they have um, and, 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 and how they relate with the things around them and the sense of social, social citizenship and also um, the, their, their psychological well-being. So that's another way to say longing. Um, and um, and this, is, this on the whole can be how comfortable they are in um, 
um, in themselves and their environment. So this is a variable called at homeness that has this kind of um, explanations or characteristics, um, but and, and it has been shown to be important amid cognitive decline, uh, which affects many other adults. But then we don't have a measure of at homeness in CLSA. Um, here I try to use a proxy of at homeness in CLSA. And, um, and, and that, that I use a combination of uh, life satisfaction, housing satisfaction, and neighborhood satisfaction. Uh, and we, we do find that it's important. So this is an example of something that is not measured that would be important. And so how you will come to this place of realizing maybe there is something that's important that is not measured is um, through community engaged interventions. That means you, do, you don't just go in and think that um, CLSA has told you everything you need to know, but rather you, you go in asking the older adults, the senior program directors, uh, or what are your experiences? Um, what 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 should we do? Um, is this intervention even the right one? Are the questions even the right ones? Um, and and so then um, different kinds of variables will emerge. I should stop now. Um, uh, to conclude, as each, oh, I'll just leave this here. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I think uh, you uh, managed to keep everyone interested and jammed a lot into that uh, presentation, which was fascinating. I myself, from a knowledge translation perspective, it's nice to have that uh, uh, type of webinar. So congrats on all that work. Um, we are turning it over to questions now. Um, if anybody has any questions, just a reminder, you can enter it into the Q&A box uh, in the bottom. I believe we have one question right now. Actually, it's more of a comment, um, is, and that is whether you have any specific recommendations that have come out of the study. You talked about implications, but any um, tangible recommendations? Well, for sure, um, but, but, but to answer that, uh, um, Shirley might have um, a, a question, a poll that would help us um, answer that question better. Um, yeah, so that's a quick poll here. Um, are you able to, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, um, maybe, maybe we will skip this poll for now. Um, Shadi, I was more thinking about um, the, um, maybe we can hold this poll for now, but um, I, I was more thinking about the question. Um, did you take on the role of, uh, maybe Joanne, you can clarify for us, Are you, did you take on the role of a policymaker, an older adult or a senior program director um, so I can answer your question accordingly? Or is that a general question? Um, so the, the participants can't actually, um, correct me if I'm wrong, participants are, are automatically muted. So I don't know that Joanne will be able to answer that unless she puts it in the chat. So I'm maybe just answer it based on it being a general question. Okay. Um, then I will tell you that there are many um, answers to this question and I, I might take up the remaining five minutes or so. Um, and so this is the recommendation. Um, okay. Assuming you are an older adult, no, let's start with the policymaker. Assuming you're a policymaker, you will want to focus. Um, so if you are carrying out um, um, interventions or you're trying to support uh, researchers to carry out interventions, you will want to focus on more deprived neighborhoods and you will want to focus on whether or not you want to know whether or not the neighborhood, what kind of um, amenities or resources are available in the neighborhood, whether or not there are greenery where older adults can gather and go grow to support one another over time, and whether or not that neighborhood is cohesive. If the neighborhood is not cohesive, then you will need to start to search for um, relevant uh, ways to um, in increase cohesion while you do whatever psychosocial interventions that you are uh, bringing in because uh, especially psychosocial interventions, if it's something else, then maybe it's, 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 it's not so um, crucial. Um, and, and that's because we know that um, social support and cohesion will um, radically alter the kind of um, um, in the mental health outcomes that you, would, you, you could expect from your interventions. So, um, so that is policymaker. If you're a director of a seniors program, you will want to start to see what kind of um, activities um, um, are, are you introducing that have you introduced that are relevant that have um, impact on the psychosocial outcomes? Um, if 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 um, your attend your your participants or your attendees or your clients don't feel like their loneliness decreased over time or it, there is no conceivable way to imagine how 
that might re reduce their loneliness, then maybe it's time to look for relevant activities or programs to introduce uh, for, for those purposes. Um, example might be, um, oof, um, there is this uh, program called Finding Meaning in Medicine, and some people have translated into different um, contexts, finding meaning in um, house, being, being, a, being a homemaker, uh, for example, or finding meaning in aging. And so maybe you can get around, uh, get a group of um, older adults and have a topic each week and then they will talk around how they, um, maybe, maybe the topic might be appreciation or loss, or which many older adults experience. Um, then they can share stories or reflections from um, their experiences. And then that, in that way, you, I, I imagine you get into a deeper um, friendship uh, much quicker, which is something that, in, in my experience of community engaged research, older adults are interested in, um, at least here in BC. Um, and then if you're an older adult, um, oh yes, cafe, coffee, um, sorry, I'm just seeing this. Yes, cafe, coffee shop, definitely, yes. Yes, that's totally true, yes, I love that, love that comment, Joanne. Um, and um, if you're an older adult, um, and, and maybe you are not engaged, or maybe you are very engaged, what you can do is you can start thinking about the, the, the street, maybe just focus on the street segment near you, uh, which which house you know has or which unit you know has um, older adult and have you seen them do you know them too do you do you know their names do you think that um, other people know their names if other people know their names maybe it's fine you don't have to be friend everybody is just not exactly possible for everyone to be a social butterfly also um, sometimes depth is is, is is difficult with 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 um with just acquaintanceship but but if, if you realize that there's somebody who's probably isolated whom um, maybe no one's there to to ask on them. Uh, maybe maybe what you can do as an individual of the adult is to engage them um, and, and maybe knock on their door and say, hey, um, yeah, just just saying hi, I can know you. Um, so that's one, and we see a lot of that happening uh, during COVID in, in the UK. People talk about um, this app called Nextdoor um, and also uh, a rise of a third way of uh, policy delivery. And then if you're a social planner, um, you'll be very excited to hear that, that there are other solutions out there than just relying on researchers or people in the authority. So you, are as, a, you as an older adult, you can play a role. But of course, if you're experiencing a lot of loneliness, uh, please do reach out. In BC, there is this number called 211 that you can call um, um, and, and look out for um, community organizations around you. I mean, we, uh, we, we have such busy lives where maybe we work or we take care of uh, children all through our lives and, and, or, or, and or maybe we, we just um, generally um, stuck at home in the last two years and we're not aware of the types of um, activities and programs that are available in your neighborhood. And what you can do um, is then to do a search of community centers or neighborhood houses and, and typically they will have some, at least some programs that are free and, and there might be a book club and there might be a knitting club or a cooking club or a just a walk in nature. So that's, that's something that would be helpful. Great. Um, well, I think that was a that was a very comprehensive response about the recommendations, and I think you covered all the main groups, so that's awesome. Um, it's uh, time is up, so I think we'll move to ending the the webinar. Um, so thank you again for uh, taking the time to um, take part in the webinar series. Uh, just a reminder: the next deadline for data access applications is June fifteenth of twenty twenty two, and you can visit the CLSA website under data access to uh, review the data that's available, as well as any additional details about the application process. Uh, also, if you can please um, uh, complete your anonymous survey upon exiting, that again will help us plan future sessions. Um, for our upcoming CLSA webinar, I believe uh, Shirley's going to put that up. Um, registrations and details will be posted on our website in the coming weeks. Um, the date will be uh, May 12th, and, uh, and it will be by Dr. Um, Melanie Levesseur. And uh, yeah, so we look forward to seeing you then. And finally, uh, remember, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, and we invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day.